of you, this segment of the presentation is addressing how to reach the rich and the affluent. Now, first of all, we should make some things clear before we, we talk about methodology of reaching people who are fluent and rich. One of the things we should make clear is the misconception that there is that rich people will not make it into the kingdom because Jesus said that rich people will not make it into the kingdom. Let's look at the book of Luke, for example, where we find the story of the rich strong ruler. And let's consider what Jesus actually did say. Chapter 18 of Luke introduces us into a young man who apparently is rich. The Bible says he is rich, so therefore he must be rich. Notice it says in verse 18, chapter 18 and verse 18. And a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, here it doesn't say a rich man, but it says a certain what? Ruler. If you were a ruler, were you rich or poor? Rich. You were rich, okay. A certain ruler. And by the way, the cross-reference for this particular passage is found in the books of Matthew. It's, re it's referred to in Mark, the same story. All right. Now, notice it says, his question, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Which means then that this ruler at least had a sense about him that uh, eternal life was something to be desired. Jesus said unto him, why do you call me good? There's none good save one that is, that is God. And just so that you understand what Jesus was saying, is that this rich young ruler did not approach Christ as God, but as a good master. As a what? A good man. Okay. And Jesus, in essence, is telling him, if I'm not God, then I'm not good. If I am not God, that I'm not good. No, I'm not good. Because the Bible says that all have what? Sin and come short of the glory of God. And it says there's none righteous. How many? None. none righteous. So Jesus is making it clear to this man that he is not just another good person. Why do you call me good? It's not good but God. In other words, if you're calling me good, then you're calling me God. Then Jesus said, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother. And the young man said, all these have I kept from my youth. Now when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, yet you lack one thing. Sell all that you have, distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. When he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very, what? He was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye and for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they that heard it said the following, who then can be saved? Because they believed that if you were rich, you were close to God. If you were poor, you were distant from God. The reason you're poor is because you are a sinner. If you're rich, then you were a saint. And so they said, if this is the case, then who in the world can be saved? Okay. Then Jesus said, 
The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Now, when it says that it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, there are some people who have gone about to explain and, and minimize what Jesus is saying. They mean well. They, they uh, are now trying to say that a needle uh, was a smaller opening in the, in the wall. That during the daytime, the gates were open, and so people can go riding on their camels into the gate. But that there was a small door at night that only one person, or if a camel went through, the camel had to get on its hands and on its legs, down crouch, and crawl in through the gate. I don't know how many of you have heard that explanation. But I would like to think that Jesus was specifically referring to what he said. Now the reason why he said that is not because rich people cannot enter into the kingdom. Because in the next chapter, which one? In the next chapter, we find another rich man. We find what? Another rich man. And I want you to notice chapter 19. The rich man's name is? Zacchaeus, the Bible says, Jesus had entered and passed through Jericho, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and again, what does it say? He was rich. Okay. So we have two rich men. How many? Two. We have one who is the rich young ruler, and we have no mention as to who or what is his name. The second one is another rich man, but this rich man is the chief of the publicans. Now the, the publicans were tax collectors, and they were considered to be uh, outcast by the Jews because they uh, were associating themselves with the Roman Empire and we're collecting taxes for the Roman Empire from the Jews. And so they were considered enemies, in essence. But if you notice, this one says that he was rich. And he's, but this one was different. Though he was rich, notice it says, and he saw to see who? Jesus, verse 3 who he was, and could not for the press because he was little of stature. So he was a tiny man, and he must have had a difficult time trying to jump up and try to see who the Savior was. So he couldn't see the Savior. So what he did then was he ran ahead and found a tree, climbed up in the tree, because that tree would be in the way where Jesus had passed through. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. Boy, what a shock that must have been for Zacchaeus, huh? There he runs to get up on the tree so he can see Jesus. And Jesus knows who he is, he calls him by name. That must have been quite a shock. And he made haste and came down. I don't know how fast he came down, but it says he made haste. So I don't know if he grabbed a hold of the limb and jumped, jumped down. I'm not sure. But if he was excited, I can guarantee you that he probably did jump on a limb and then swung down to the ground and got down as fast as he could. And he received them joyfully. How? Joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that, that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. See that? So the Jews considered publicans to be what? Sinners. Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him how much? Four times. 
And Jesus said unto him, This day is what? Salvation come to this house, for as much as he is also son of Abraham. Now, notice something interesting here. There are two rich men. What is the difference between them? One is looking for salvation. The other one is looking for the Savior. There are many people today who want salvation. And when you give them Bible studies, you have to be careful that you don't present to them that Jesus can save them and that they can be saved from death and that they can go to heaven and live forever. All that is true. But if that's all you teach them, you let them to be like the rich and ruler who only wanted to be saved, but not at any sacrifice. The difference is this. One was looking to save his skin. The other one didn't care about his skin. He was looking to, to know the Savior. And this one found salvation. The other one did not. So when Jesus says, uh, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom, it's not that the rich man cannot be saved. It's simply then that the, the potential, the, the tendency is that rich men can put their focus and emphasis only on making riches. Making what? Riches. riches. And that the spiritual life to them is not of any consequence. They focus on making themselves comfortable in this world and do not have any aspiration, any desire, any thought about the life hereafter. Now I can say this to you, however, that not everybody is that way. Okay? I know a lot of rich people who love the things of God and who want to follow God. In fact, I can tell you this, that in the Bible, the people who were the richest were people who were following God. Now, when you think about it, think about uh, jo Job. How rich do you think Job was? Do you have any idea? How rich was he? Well, it says that Job uh, had a lot of material things. Is that true? Okay. Uh, it speaks about that this man is uh, quite rich. Notice in uh, verse 3 of Job chapter 1. His substance also was 7,000 sheep. How many thousand sheep? 7,000 sheep. That means that this man had a lot of workers. Is that true? How many workers do you think you need to take care of 7,000 sheep? Hmm? Seven zero? That's one shepherd per a thousand sheep. It says 7,000. All right. Notice it says, and he had 3,000 what? Camels. How many camels? 3,000 camels. And 500 what? Yoke of oxen. And 500 she asses. And a very great what? Household. So that this man was the greatest of all the men of the East. Now think about it. If you had that many animals, that means that you had to have many servants to take care of those animals. Is that true? Which means then that those servants also had wives and children. Correct? Which means then that he had to have some accountants to keep track of all that the the transactions that were taking place. This man was a man of a huge business enterprise. 
Is that true? Huge business enterprise. I mean, if you have, for example, 3,000 camels, how many people, normally speaking, can take care of so many camels? I mean, if you have 10 camels, you have your hands full. But this is a lot of camels, which means then that he had to have people who were raising food for these camels. So he had to have land to feed these animals, correct? 7,000 sheep means that he had to have a lot of land for grazing. And I don't know if you know anything about sheep, but sheep, if you let them graze in the same spot, they will kill the, the grass. So they have to be moved all the time. How much grass do you think you need to feed 7,000 sheep? Do you understand what I'm saying? So, was Job very, very rich? What do you say? Extremely rich. But what was his relationship with God? He had a very close relationship with God. Now, the, the sad thing, did you hear what I said? The sad thing is that when Job was given the victory by God, okay, God then restored to him more than he had before. So poor Job now, whereas before he had uh, 7,000 sheep, now he has double what he had before. So, so, so now you have 14,000 sheep, right? So now you got a greater burden than you had before. Now you have 6,000 camels rather than 3,000 camels. So how rich was Job? So question, is there anything wrong with being rich? No. Okay? Nothing wrong with being rich. Was Abraham rich? Yes. Was Isaac rich? Yes. Was Jacob rich? Yes. And so, what about Solomon? He was very rich. What about David? Very rich. So the problem is not the issue of richness, having treasures, having abundance. The problem is where the heart is. That's the problem. And if you understand that, then you, you will not think that it's a waste of time to try to reach people of affluence or people who are rich. Also, you should know this, that a lot of people who are rich don't want you to know that they're rich. I have friends that are millionaires, I mean millionaires. I had a friend who passed away who was a billionaire. In fact, when he sold his business, it sold for $8 billion. Now, what's $8 billion? Do you know? Mm -hmm. Anybody know what $8 billion is? Well, you know what the number is, but you have no idea how many millions that is and how many thousands it is. Uh, I suppose that to have $1 billion, if you have $1 bill, uh, it would be more than would fit into this particular room here, okay, of $1 billion bills. So, when he died, he sold his business and he sold it for $8 billion. But this particular man was an Adventist. And he was very, very faithful in giving to the church and giving to the cause of God quite uh, freely. So I wanted to just give you that background. In the scriptures, you have two rich men in Luke chapter 18 and Luke chapter 19. The one is lost and the other one is saved. And the only difference is their motive. Is there what? Their motive. One was seeking salvation apart from 
the Savior. The other one was seeking for the Savior and was not so much concerned about salvation. But because he won the Savior, he got salvation. So when you're dealing with people who are affluent and people who may be rich, you have to remember that they have everything already. They have how much? Everything already. And it's very hard to give something to somebody who always has everything. I, I always find myself challenged to know why do you give somebody who has everything. So I always try to find spiritual things because I know that it doesn't matter how much riches every, every rich person has. When it comes to spirituality, all of us can be benefited by more spirituality. You understand? Okay, now, here's a statement concerning uh, rich people. This comes from Gospel Workers. And it is found in 349. The servants of Christ should labor faithfully for the rich men in our cities, as well as for the poor and lowly. So what does it say? We should labor for, faithfully for the rich men in our cities as well as for the poor and lowly. There are many wealthy men who are susceptible to the influences and impressions of the gospel message. And who, when the Bible and the Bible alone is presented to them as the expositor of Christian faith and practice, will be moved by the Spirit of God to open doors for the advancement of the gospel. They will reveal a living faith in the Word of God and will use their entrusted means to prepare the way of the Lord to make straight in the desert a highway of our God. So the counsel is to work for the rich. Now, some of us may never have the opportunity to get close to rich people. Simply because maybe our job and our work, our association may not be within those circles. But you never know. And do not assume that because you are a little person in your own eyes, that God cannot use you to reach a big person. Do you understand? One of the things that rich people do not like is for you to like them for their riches. People who are rich do not appreciate people who only seek them for what they have. When people get rich, if they have any sense about them, they recognize that there are people who are trying to get close to them just to get out of them something for themselves. And so wealthy people are always with their antennas up. They're looking for something that is genuine because in their circles, they find a lot of plasticity. They find a lot of what? Plasticity. People who are acting and doing just for the benefit of imp impressing somebody else. And somebody who has gotten to the place where they're rich, if they really are rich, they are no longer tr satisfied with trying to impress anybody. They've already reached that level and they don't any longer feel that they have to be trying to make an impression on you. So what impresses a rich person the most is to find something that is real. Something that they consider to be genuine. Something that they consider to be not plastic, not something that they put on, but something that's real. And so, 
That's why sometimes you find rich people who will just put on plain clothes, blue jeans and a, and a shirt, and they'll go to some foreign country and they're looking for opportunities to satisfy a longing that they have to be able to help somebody who can't help them. They find satisfaction in that. They find no satisfaction in the gaiety and all the ex ex exhilarating things that people are involved in. And so, there are many people who, who do not try to show their means. I was just talking to a rich man before I came out here, and he was showing me pictures of, of India and uh, other countries that he uh, was visiting. And the pictures of himself among the people that he was taking, or people taking pictures of him, uh, he was, you know, with a blue jeans and a pair of a shirt, and he looked like a very common person. Now, the people around him had no idea that he was a very rich person, but he was so, so pleased that they were treating him, they liked him, and they wanted to be around him, not because he had riches, but because he was a nice person. And so, uh, to him, that was satisfying his soul. And then, his real burden was to find children that were either handicapped or needed special surgery or needed something that would make their life easier and better. And when he would find those children, then he would invest in buying and paying for the medical care, the surgeries and all that, flying them to the United States and getting them taken care of. Uh, and he did all that without people knowing what was going on. Because he didn't want applause. He didn't want anybody to give him credit. He just wanted the sheer joy of knowing that he could help somebody just because he could help them. So he was showing me these pictures. And as he showed me pictures of young children that he had helped, he couldn't keep back the tears because he was so happy that he had helped this young child and that young child and this young child. In fact, uh, I was doing an evangelistic meeting in the church and uh, he was sitting in a chair in the foyer and he, he said to me, he said, uh, how many students do you have? And I said, well, right now I have five. And he said, uh, and uh, did you have to pay for the advertisement and things like that, you know? I said, yeah. He said, about how much? I said, oh, I don't know, maybe about a thousand dollars, something like that. So uh, he said, oh, okay. And then I was, coming by the hallway, I went to talk to other people, I was coming by the hallway, and, and then I was sitting down in the audience, and a, a shoulder tap, a, somebody tapped him on the shoulder, and I, I uh, looked around, and he slipped something down my, my pocket, and I pulled it out, it was a check for $7,000, okay? Now, I had no idea that that man had any money. <laughs> I was just glad to talk to him. He was there with a cane, you know, sitting there with suspenders and his blue jeans and all that. And it turns out that's the man that's telling me about all the things that he was doing for children around the world. So I had no idea that this man was wealthy. Uh, and so, and I wasn't looking for any donations. I wouldn't, he, it just came out of his heart. He, he saw these young people. He was so impressed with them and their fervor for, for working for the Lord that he felt like he had to do something. Uh, to contribute to it. Do you understand what I'm saying? So when you deal with rich people, treat them the same with kindness and courtesy that you treat anybody else. And they appreciate that more than if you just are wowed with this person has money and all that. They don't, they don't appreciate that at all. The only ones that appreciate something like that is people who are rich and they're caught up in their riches. And the only thing that brings joy to them is if you give them attention because they are rich. 
And most of those people are movie stars, rock and roll stars, and people like that. Okay? But people who have actually labored and worked to become rich are different than people who get rich overnight because of some being a star or being a rock star or something like that. These people who are in that business are there to make money. To make what? And to become what? Famous. Now, if you want to become famous, who are you thinking about? Yourself. So they're looking for becoming famous. And that's why when I was, quote, famous in that realm, that what gratified us the most is to have more people out there screaming and yelling for us. And there's a certain exhilaration that came when people wanted to grab you and touch you as though you were something special. Okay? So, people who are in that mode, they, they are caught up in their riches. And they would be in the class of the rich young ruler. However, there are other people who are quite wealthy who give of their means. Uh, for example, you have uh, the man who built what is called Microsoft. And his last name happens to be what? Gay. I understand that that man uh, gives a huge part of his fortune to charities. And that because he did that, uh, Steve Jobs was so impressed with what he was doing that Steve Jobs decided that he also would contribute to the same, donor, same organizations. And so one benevolent person inspired another person who was wealthy to give of a means for other causes than uh, just satisfying themselves. And when Steve Jobs was dying, he made a statement that he says that before he was dying, the last thing he wrote, that he could hear the machines, he can see the little blue lights blinking, and then he said uh, that all the fame and all the wealth that he had passed on into insignificance. Into what? Insignificance. He no longer seemed to care about his wealth, and his fame, why? They were serving him for nothing. Okay, so it says uh, concerning rich people, and now I'll get into how you reach them. For years, a perplexing question had been before us How can we raise funds adequate for the support of the missions? which the Lord has gone before us to open. We read the plain commands of the gospel and the missions in both home and foreign fields present their necessities. The indications, yea, the positive revelations of providence unite in urging us to do quickly the work that is waiting to be done. The Lord desires that money men shall be converted. The Lord just asked what? Money that money man shall be converted and act as his helping hand in reaching others. He desires that those who can help in the work of reform and restoration shall see the precious light of truth, be transformed in character, and be led to use their entrusted capital in his service. He would have them invest the means he has lent them in doing good, in opening the way for the gospel to be preached to all classes, nigh and afar off. So what is the will of the Lord? That we work also for people who have means. Now having said that, you would assume then that God is only interested in the money of people, right? But that's not the case. When the Lord speaks about laying up treasure in heaven, what is he talking about? He's speaking about saving souls in heaven. But he uses the term laying treasures in heaven. And the reason for that is that God equates 
saving people with money. In other words, when you invest in the salvation of others, you are investing in the only treasure that heaven is interested in. God is not interested in, in money per se. He didn't give his son to save money. In fact, we know that the holy city is made with what kind of gold? Transparent gold. How much is transparent gold worth? Do you know? Does transparent gold exist? Yes. I talked to one of the technicians that installs the windshield on the jetliners. And those windshields are about this big, you know what I'm saying? And each a windshield has a film of transparent gold. There are two plate glass that are pressed together and there's transparent gold film in between them. That transparent gold, the last time I asked its value, and that was about 1996, was $25,000. Okay, now twenty-five thousand dollars today is probably maybe forty thousand dollars. So one of those plate glasses uh, happens to cost a lot of coconuts, right? And that's a film of transparent gold. It's a what? A film, and the film is very thin, correct? So you have to ask the question then: If a plate glass with a film of transparent gold, cost $40,000, then how much is God investing in the holy city? Where it says that the streets are made of what? Transparent gold. And the walls are made of what? Transparent gold. So how much is God investing in that city? A little or a lot? Far more than we can ever imagine. So God is not interested in the person's money. He's interested in the person's salvation. And so, if people invest in giving to the cause of God, they actually are investing in the potential for other people to find salvation. And if other people find salvation, by that means, they are then investing in the treasure in heaven. So when you give a dollar, you're actually giving the potential of winning a soul. Let me explain it to you also this way, so you understand where I'm coming from. In the old days, in Rome, the Roman soldiers were paid with something called salt. That was their salary. It was salt. Blocks of salt. And the reason why they were paid with salt was because salt was very valuable. And for a soldier, salt was very necessary because it was with salt that they could preserve their food in those days. And it was with salt that they could heal their wounds when they were wounded. It might have been painful, but it kept them from getting infection, okay? So salt was very, very necessary, and the soldiers were paid with salt. That's where we get the word salary from today. So when you're being paid a salary, uh, you perhaps have heard the adage, he is not worth his salt. Have you heard that phrase? What does it mean? His, his labor is not worth what, you're being, what they're paying him for, okay? So he's not worth his salt. Comes from that old times when they used to pay soldiers with salt. So you get salary today. So what you're actually getting is that they're paying you a certain amount in exchange, in exchange for your time and talents. 
Life is lived out in increments of time and talents. So time and talents equal life, or life equals time and talents. You live in time. And in time, the way you live is you exercise your abilities. Is that true? Yes or no? Okay. So, when a person is being paid for their labor, they're actually being paid in exchange for the time and the talents that they exert. So you get salt for your life. Now, what happens, however, is this. That some people think that your life is worth less than somebody else's life. And we do that by simply paying what we think a person's skills and life is worth. In other words, you go and work for Burger King here, and they may pay you $9 an hour. Well, what they're telling you is that the effort that you exercise, the skills, and the life that you use to exercise those skills is only worth $9. Do you understand? Now, now that we think about it, we're thinking, well, people don't think we're worth very much. Okay? Now, Somebody, however, will work and they'll get paid $1,000 an hour. Same time, but now that time is considered to be worth more than somebody else's. That is why when God asks people to give, he doesn't give an amount. He gives a percentage. The reason for that is that God wants us all to give equally. Now, you say, now wait a minute. What do you mean equally? Since God measures you by the life that he gives you and the exercise of that life, then when people decide that they're going to pay you $9 for an hour of your life and they think that's how much you're worth, God then asks you to give a percentage and not an amount. So, let me explain it to you this way. Let's suppose that Pastor Stephen is working and he makes $50 an hour. Okay? How much? $50 an hour. And let's suppose that uh, one of you works in a supermarket and makes $50 a week. So he makes $50 an hour and she's making $50 a week. Okay. Now let's suppose that they both go to church and they both drop $25 into the basket. Now who gave more? Hmm? She gave more. Why do you say she gave more? Because she gave half of her week of life and only he gave half of an hour of life. Do you understand? So that's why when Jesus saw the widow dropping the mite, She said she gave more than all of these because she gave of her wants. In other words, it took her more of her life to make up that little mite that she gave to God while the others, it just took a few minutes or even just a moment of a negotiation to make a bundle and give. I know some friends, I have some friends that just one phone call makes them $25,000. Just what? One phone call. In that phone call, they make a transaction and bingo, they have $25 they just made. 
And I've been with them. They said, Pastor, pray for me. I got to make some phone calls. And so, okay, we pray. And gring, 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 gring. And they talk, negotiate, pretty soon, click. He said, all right, Pastor, I just made $25,000. All right? So, but that's, that's chicken feed in comparison to what I know other people can make in one transaction. All right? So, God gave not an amount, but God gave life. For God so loved the world that he gave his what? His only begotten son. So what God is interested is that you and I learn to give life as well. So when we give of our money, we are actually giving back a portion of our life. And by it, we show that we value that thing that we call life. And because God loves life, he wants you and I also to love life. So the more lives you save through the life you give will be more treasure that you amount up in heaven. And that's good news. What do you say? Do you understand? Now, getting back to the rich then. So, what are rich people really interested in? Uh, from my associations with rich people, once they have the means that they have and want, and sometimes people have so much they don't know what to do with it, except just continue to invest it so they don't lose it. Uh, but once they get to the place where it doesn't matter anymore, then uh, we find that people like that are more interested in it that which has intrinsic value, intrinsic value. Okay, that which has what? Intrinsic, intrinsic value. Okay. They are no longer interested in just getting things for themselves. In fact, the man who had eight billion dollars and sold it I was in Australia, in Brisbane. Uh, he called me up. And he said, Pastor Torres, he said, uh, I got bad news. I said, what's the matter? He said, um, I got cancer. So I said, well, well I said, what's the prognosis? He said, I went to medical center. They did the biopsy and all that. And I have a very aggressive cancer. And they said that the best they could do is preserve and prolong my life for a few months. So he said, I just uh, wrote them a check for what, they, uh, what the expenses were, about $180,000. So I wrote them a check, paid off the, the uh, bill, and went home. And then he called me to, to tell me that he didn't have long to live. He asked me to send him a, a note, so I tried to get a note to him by FedEx, but apparently it never got to him. He died sooner than, than he anticipated. I noticed that he had sent me a letter, and I noticed that the letter that he sent me was in an envelope that had already been canceled, that is, you know, when it goes through the uh, postage system and you have a stamp and they put a cancellation on that stamp so you can't use it again. But I noticed that he did not send his letter in a brand new envelope. He took an envelope that had already been used to save money. Okay. Here he has how much? Eight billion dollars. And he sends me an envelope that had already been used. Which means that this man was very sensitive about spending money. Do you understand? Perhaps that's why he became so rich. But his, his focus uh, was not in how much he had. He loved to uh, help us 
in our school, he particularly wanted to sponsor students to come and learn how to do soul winning. So any time I had a student that didn't have money and they wanted to come to the school, uh, he had told me, he said, any student that you think uh, has a need, just give them my address and let them send a, a note that you are recommending them and I'll take care of it. So he was always sending money up to the school to support this student or that student. He, he had great joy in seeing young men and women learning to serve the Lord because that's what his heart was in. You understand? So, first of all, where do you find rich people? And then, how do you reach them? Most uh, rich people, because of their wealth, have to spend it and most of the time they have to kind of live in places where they feel somewhat secure. So because of that, it is not always possible to reach them. Not because they want to be isolated, but because they know that there are too many wicked people out there who would do anything to hurt them and their spouses or their children to get their money. So a lot of rich people try to live in situations that at least they can feel that there's some level of security for them. Okay. So because of that, I said that sometimes it's difficult to, uh, to locate them, to get acquainted with them. Sometimes uh, you can go to places where they do go. Uh, and that would require an outlay of funds. For example, there are some wealthy people who love golfing. Golf has become one of the uh, extracurricular activities that wealthy people like to do. And because of that, uh, there are always other wealthy people who go to the same place. So you can, if you can afford it, uh, pay a few dollars and go to a golf course. Now, these wealthy people have club memberships, so uh, it's not always easy to get to where they, they are. But there are times that you can meet wealthy people in uh, the golf course. You go and you may be in the same place, you may not know that somebody's wealthy, but you can find them. Uh, also, uh, restaurants. Uh, some wealthy people uh, try to avoid ritzy restaurants. They don't like to pay a lot of money for food. Uh, they feel that they can uh, buy the food at a better price. And usually they try to find little nukes that they can locate that have good food and that they can go and just be another J John Doe. So they'll find little kind of like hole in the wall places. Well, you find them there they're enjoying their food, and as far as everybody's concerned, they're just another individual, somebody who is uh, nobody, because they are going to a place that you don't, you don't expect rich people to go to. So they try to find these places, and I have friends that have these, these special places that they like to go to. Uh, I was just with one of my friends who, who is a, a multimillionaire, and uh, he was telling me about a place that he likes to go to. He said, you need to go there. So my wife and I said, okay, we'll go there. And this place is way out in the boondocks. I mean, it's, it's a restaurant, but it's the only restaurant. There's no, there are not even houses around there. All there are is farms around there, okay? And out there in this farm community, there's this little restaurant that's, that serves excellent vegetarian food. And so, he said, you need to go there. So we went there. It's a very pleasant little place. And it's always full of people who likewise. And most of the people who go there, you can tell that they're people of means just simply by the sweater they're wearing or the shoes that they're wearing. You understand? You can tell by what they're wearing that these people are people of means. 
They may be plain, but the, what they're wearing, uh, it's obviously uh, good material, you understand? So we went there, a delightful little place. It's not the kind of place that you would expect somebody who's a multimillionaire to go visit or frequent, but that's the place he loves to go to. So uh, when I meet with this particular person, he always is in a blue jean and a shirt. You'll never find him in a suit or et cetera. So uh, what he likes the most of all things, he loves nature. He loves to plant food. And uh, so uh, sometimes I call and the secretary says, you better call him on the cell phone. He's on his toy. And why the toy is, he's either driving a tractor or he's driving a bulldozer or he's driving some big machinery because he loves building and he loves the, the mechanical and the, and the physical things to do. So uh, because he has the means, he can buy the big machines and then he can go around and play around with them. You understand? So uh, these are the kind of things that he likes to do. So I've learned that people of means try to be uh, kind of a, um, live in sort of a, a, uh, an atmosphere that hides the reality of what they are so that they, they can then freely uh, enjoy what they're doing without feeling like somebody's after them for the purpose of, of getting money out of them. You understand? Does that make sense to you? So, how do you get close to them? Uh, many times it's just simply by sheer providence where you can get acquainted with them simply because they know somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody that you know. In my situation, it's just simply that the Lord has put them in my path. Another way that uh, I find that you can reach them is... Uh, I try to do evangelistic meetings for the wealthy, but I try to do seminars that I feel they would have an interest in. So usually I try to do the meetings at a Hilton Hotel. In what? A Hilton Hotel. Uh, so in Guam, for example, when I want to reach the upper class and I want to present some seminars, I rent the Hilton Hotel. Now that means it's going to cost me some shackles, right? But the, but the expense is worth the while. For example, uh, not long ago I wanted to do a meeting for the upper echelons. And I have been able to, by God's grace, uh, become acquainted with people. Now some of the things that I do uh, may be a little bit different than, than what you're accustomed to. For example, I hold in my pocket uh, something that most people don't hold. You see that? Now what is that? It's a golden badge. But what does it say on it? It says police. What does it say? Police. police. So here's what I've done. I move into a city, and when I move into a city, one of the first things I want to do is I want to get acquainted with the operational arts of the city. So one of the first things I do is go into the chief of police. The what? The chief of police. And I introduce myself to the chief of police and tell him that I'm the new pastor in the, in the, in, in the city, and I just wanted him to know that according to the Bible, that we're told to pray for those who are in the police force. Did you know that the Bible tells you to do that? Yes, yes or no? Yes. No? Yes? Yeah. The Bible tells you to do that. And I'll read it to you just so that you don't have to be doubting Thomases anymore. Okay? Here's what it says. Paul is writing, and he is admonishing people, Christians, to uh, behave themselves. And because he does that, 
people misunderstand what he's actually trying to say. But here's, uh, here's what it says. I'm looking at Romans 13, by the way. It says, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there's no power but of God. The powers that are, are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisted the power, resisted the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Will then thou not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise to the same. For he is a minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. What does that mean? He bears not the sword in vain. In today's language, he bears not the gun in vain. Okay? Then it says, For he is a minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. What do you have a police department for? To take revenge on men that do what? Evil. Okay? So, uh, in the temple in the Jerusalem, there was something called the temple police. The what? The temple police. They were not there to menace people. They were there to make sure that things were orderly and that things could be guided in the right direction. Okay? And if people misbehaved, then they were there to make sure that they were brought out of the temple so that they would not carry on inside the temple. Well, so I go to the, to the police department, introduce myself, tell them that uh, we need to pray for the leaders of our community and I like to pray for them. So I pray. And also I offer my services. I tell them that I've been a chaplain in the police department in some other place and that I'll be more than glad to help them out as a chaplain. Now, so I did that in Guam. I went to the police department, introduced myself, and the chief said to me, you're an answer to prayer. I said, what do you mean? He said, I've been wanting to start a chaplain's department in, in my police force, but didn't know how to do it. And since you've been a chaplain before, will you help me start a chaplain's department in my police department? I said, gladly. So I helped him to start a chaplain's department. And most of the chaplains that I got in were some of the agonists. Okay. Then, uh, he wanted to deputize me. To what? Deputize me. So he called up the governor and told the governor that he wanted to deputize a, a, a chaplain. So then he took me to the governor and before the governor then, uh, I was sworn in. Of course, I don't swear. I tell him I affirm. Okay? So I was sworn in before the governor as a chaplain of the police department. Now I know the governor. The who? The governor. You understand? And then the governor introduces me to the lieutenant governor. Now I know the lieutenant governor. And of course he knows me. You see what I'm saying? So what's happening? I'm getting acquainted with what? With people who are leaders in the community. Then in that seminar that I was holding, there were several uh, high people who came to the Hilton, of course. And I made some uh, presentations that would attract them. So they came. And one of the ladies that attended happened to be the vice president of the university. So she attended. And when she attended, I passed out decision cards. She filled it out. And guess what? She wanted to be baptized. She didn't raise her hand because important people don't want other people to know what they're doing. But she put it on the decision card. I, and she put, I would like a visit. So I went to visit her. Long story short, today she is uh, the vice president of the only university in Guam, very loyal. And she's given Bible studies all the time to the people in the, in the, in the university. In fact, it's interesting that she became friends with Geraldine Chang, uh, Pastor Pujolsko's wife. And so they do a Bible study with several 
high-level people in Guam by Skype. So they're Skyping with these high level. Then, in another seminar that I was holding, I baptized a, a very uh, influential man. And that influential man, his name is Steve Kasperbauer. Well, Steve Kasperbauer's father is a retired senator, and his mother is a retired senator. And Steve Kasperbauer, uh, of all things, is a, a very successful businessman who is the only one, after he was baptized, that closes down the shop now on Sabbath. He has a water sports business. He has tourists that come, and he's on the main drag, so everybody sees his business, and he's loaded with, with tourists that come to his business all the time. Sometimes he has 1,400 tourists that go through his business a day. So this man has been blessed by the Lord. But he's the only one that shuts down on Friday afternoon and doesn't open up un until uh, Sunday morning. Okay? But the Lord blessed him. Well, he was baptized in my meetings. And through my, when I went to visit him, I had to treat him like anybody else. Treat him like what? Anybody else. And you have to remember this. Important people or business people, when the Spirit of God is working on them, usually they're very honest people. And because they're honest people, the enemy can use that honesty against them. And what do I mean? When I went to visit him, I saw in his card that he believed in the Sabbath and all that, but I also saw that he wouldn't get baptized. So I visited him uh, just to find out who he was and what, why he only checked certain things and not the other. So when I sat with him, uh, he was surprised. He said, I filled out the card, but I always thought nobody ever checked those. So he was surprised that I checked on them. So I went, sat down with him, and when I asked him the question, what will keep you from being baptized? He said, Pastor, he said, uh, and he was very respectful, he said, uh, I, am, I can't do that. I said, can you explain to me why? He said, number one, I'm $3 million in debt. So I thought, and he said, for me to shut down on Saturday, be baptized and then shut down on Saturday, would mean that I would be cheating people of the money that I owe them because if I shut down on Saturday, which is the biggest day of business, and I'm already $3 million in debt, I might as well claim bankruptcy. And he said, I, I don't believe that God would want me to cheat people of money that I owe them. So is he thinking nobly or is he thinking, how is he thinking? That was noble. What do you say? A lot of people would want to get out of $3 million of debt. Right? But he wasn't willing to do that because to him it would be cheating people. Then he said, I have 200 employees. And remember this, as I said, Important people who have employees and all that have to think about what would happen by their decision. So he said, if I decide to keep the Sabbath and my business goes under, I will be affecting 200 men who will be affecting their wives and their children. So I'll be affecting at least about 800 people leaving them without work, and uh, I don't think that would be right. You just think of myself and not of them. And then he said, I have 13 contracts with all the hotels on the beach. I provide their beach equipment. And he said, how can I just think of myself and leave them in a lurch without giving them a way to have the beach equipment that they need to take care of their clients. So, what do you think? Good reasons? Hard reasons to deal with, right? So how do you deal with somebody like that? They're giving you all the good reasons why they can't do what God has asked. And those reasons were more difficult than Pastor Stephen gave me last night. 
Now, I looked at him and I asked him this question because now that I see that the man is honest, he's what? He's honest, he is sincere, and he is thinking about what his decision would do to others. And that's a good quality, what do you say? So I saw that the man was sincere, so I said to him, ask him this question, tell me, what is more important to you, your business or your salvation? And I waited. And he paused, and he thought. Then I saw a tear come into his eye. And he looked at me and he said, my salvation. And I said, Steve, if your salvation is more important to you, God has taken note of that. And God will give you a way of escape. I don't know how, but God will do it. Only do what God has asked you to do. I said, can we pray about that? So I knelt down. And when he saw me kneeling down, he knelt down. And then I prayed for him. When we got up, there were tears running down his face and he thanked me for coming. And I knew that he was going to follow through because he was an honest person. Two years later, he calls me, and he says, is this Pastor Torres? I said, yes. You have a moment. I said, yes, who is this? He said, I'm Steve Kaffenbaum from Guam. Remember me? I said, of course. I said, how are you doing? He said, let me tell you what happened. And then he said this. I went and got baptized. He said, I wasn't keeping the Sabbath yet, but I decided to give my heart to God first. So I went and got baptized. I took all the 13 contracts and I gave them to my competitors so that at least I would feel like the hotels were being taken care of. Then he said, I cut my staff down to 100 and I found work for every single staff member that I did not keep. So I got a job for the hundred that I let go. Now you can't help but admire a person like that. What do you say? Okay. So then he said, then the moment came. I told the staff that I was shutting down on Saturday. They didn't understand. They thought I was getting sick or something. So he said, I shut down. Friday afternoon, and he said, I, I, I was nervous because I, I didn't know what would happen. And I thought that Saturday, if I didn't get tourists, then I would be dead the rest of the week. So he went to sleep and he woke up. And it was dark outside, so he thought it was still nighttime. And it turned out it was 8 o'clock in the morning. He said he had never slept that long in his life. When he went to look in the window, he discovered that it was pouring rain. And he thought that was unusual because the day before, he keeps a watch on forecasts all the time because he's the water sports activity. So he said there was no forecast for rain and it was pouring rain. And it was dark outside. So he got his family ready. They got to church and... Uh, after church, when they got out, it was sunny outside. So he thought that was rather unusual to have rain in the, in the dry season, especially when there was no forecast. So that night he went after sunset to check on his uh, office, and he saw the light uh, blinking uh, for the voice uh, recorder. So he checked it. And they discovered that nobody went 
to do anything on that day because of the storm. But everybody also, they didn't want to go with their competitors. So they waited, they left their registration on the phone, and that Sunday morning, he was packed with tourists and the rest of the week. And then he said, it rained for seven months every Sabbath. So he said, it was incredible, he said. And then he told me, he said, uh, believe it or not, what I could not do in seven days a week, 24 hours a day, I could never keep up with my debts. He said, I paid all the three million dollars off. I am debt free. And he says, the day that I do not do anything but rest in the Lord, the Lord has allowed me to have a better thinking process so I can make better business decisions. So then he said, you help me, how can I help you? Well, I said, I'm going to the Philippines and uh, I need a thousand Bibles. He said, and how much is that? I said, five dollars a Bible. He said, you got it. You stop over in, the, in, in Guam and I'll give you a check for the Bibles. So I did, I stopped in Guam, he gave me a check for the Bibles. I went to the Philippines and bought a thousand Bibles. And then held a meeting and I had 1,200 people who wanted to get baptized. So on Friday, he called me up and said, Pastor, how's it going? I said, you won't believe it, but there are 1,200 people who want to get baptized. He said, what, 1,200? He said, can I come and see? I said, yeah, but how are you going to get here? He said, that's my problem, not yours. And he said, I'll see you there. And I don't know what he did. But he had to get a, he took a flight from Guam to Japan, Japan down to Manila, Manila down to Cebu, Cebu down to where I was. So I don't know how much money he paid, because he bought that on the same day, you understand? But to him it didn't matter. He wanted to get down there to see that group of people being baptized. When he got there, uh, I was surprised. He actually showed up. And when he got there and saw 1,200 people being baptized, he just cried. And then to think that he was able to give $5,000 so that these people can get their own Bibles in their own language. But then he opened up one of the Bibles and he saw that it was small print. And he came to me and he said, Pastor, this Bible has small print. Well, I hadn't looked at the print. I just simply asked some Filipino to buy these 5,000 Bibles, you know. I mean, these 1,000 Bibles. So he said, these people need glasses to read this, this Bible. I said, I suppose. He said, I'll take care of it. Well, Saturday night he disappeared. I don't know where he went. Sunday morning he came back with a thousand glasses. So he bought a thousand glasses just to make sure that the people who got the Bibles could read them. Okay. Now, he is a very unassuming person. He calls himself a beach bum. What? A beach bum. And when you see him, uh, you would never think that the man has two shekels to rub together. He always runs around in shorts, you know, and a shirt. And you never know that the man has anything. Now, what's interesting is this. He begun to witness to his employees and several of them have already given themselves to the Lord. Then uh, his wife's first cousin uh, is very high up in, in the government. And through that situation, we're witnessing to people who are very high up in that society. Now what happens, pardon me, what happens is that oftentimes they'll invite me to some event because they want to have me exposed to people of influence 
so that I could befriend them and pray with them and uh, do something to bring the gospel to them. So one time when the Supreme Court judge from the United States came to Guam, uh, they arranged for me to be the one to have the invocation for the meeting. And uh, that Supreme Court judge um, then talked with me and I was able to give her two books. One is called The Great Controversy and I had her name printed on it. And then the one called Elsa, which is the life story of my mother that I wrote. So I gave it to her. And later on, after she left, she wrote me on a letter, and which I have at home, uh, telling me how grateful she was for the two books that I gave her, and that she would hold them as a, a treasure of the memory of meeting me. So uh, through one event to another, I have the opportunity to get acquainted with people who are very high up. Now, uh, I have, I have had opportunity to baptize people, a king, a president, etc. And what I've discovered with all of them, and it's, it's the same with all of them, is that they, they are not willing to openly speak about their particular uh, preferences of faith, etc. Uh, they're very private. But when they have confidence in somebody who, can, who treats them like a person, uh, especially somebody that they can have confidence in, spiritually speaking. They'll open up and they'll share with you their questions and their concerns. And so, I had a president like that. Um, I went to an island country called Palau. When I arrived, I went to City Hall to meet the king. He was a governor and king. So I went in there to t let them know I was a new pastor in the community and I wanted to come and pray for him. He acted like he had no interest, just treated me with respect, but nothing else. I gave him my phone number, my card, and I said, if I can serve you in any way, please let me know. Well, that night he called me, and he told me he wanted to see me. And I asked him what time. He said, two in the morning. So I said, okay. Where do you want me to meet you? He said, in my house. So I said, give me some directions so I know how to get there. So he gave me the directions. At two o'clock in the morning, I showed up in his mansion and knocked on the door, and he had a gun by his side when I knocked on the door. He opened the door, and once he was sure that it was me, and by the way, I don't know how many dogs he has around there, but, uh, I've counted at least eight dogs. As soon as you go into the place, they come out barking. Boy, are they, <laughs> they're aggressive. Anyway, so as soon as he knew it was me, he let me in. And we started Bible studies together at two o'clock in the morning. So I would go and visit him at two o'clock in the morning to study the Bible. The man had an interest in spiritual things. But in the community, he always acted like this person who, you know, was in control and had no needs, etc. But privately, he would open up his heart and tell me about his concerns and, and share with me the mistakes he had made. And, and then he would seek the counsel. You think I should have done this or I should have done that. He told me about, for example, he had a relationship with a young woman. And uh, the young woman had a child. And he wanted to know, was his right or wrong, uh, what he was doing. And I said to him, I showed him from the Bible. And he said, now what do I do? I said, well, do what you need to do. You, the child you need to take care of. The, young, the girl was about 18 years old. And of course, he was about 50 years old. And so, he said, well, the problem is that the family kind of pushed her under me because they wanted her to be connected to royalty. See, the same problem, right? It's what they can get out of them, you understand? So he said, I fell for it, and now I'm sorry. I said, well, I'll give you the counsel of what to do. So he followed the counsel, 
He took care of the girl, he took care of the boy, the baby, but he made sure that he never had any relationship again that way. So finally, uh, I also began a relationship with a governor in that island and would talk to them spiritually. And when I left the island, because I was serving as a missionary, uh, I had a dream that that governor would become president. So I sent a letter to the governor. And I said, I had a dream that you're gonna become president, but don't forget the temple. I had asked him to help us build a church. So he was helping us build a church. I was afraid that if he became president, he would get distracted. So I said, don't forget the temple, Nehemiah. I never heard from him until two years later, I got a call uh, asking me to go and dedicate the temple. When I arrived, he built, my wife had designed the church, but it, it's a huge church, three stories high, 600 seating capacity church, huge building. And they finished it in two years and paid for it. So uh, when I went, and landed in the island and had dignitaries pick me up, uh, I asked. And they said, I said, who's the president? And it was the man I wrote a letter to. So finally the next day, the office of the president called. He wanted to see me. So when I went to the office, I had this question in my mind. Whatever happened to that letter? So I said to him, I read you a letter two years ago and you never responded. He said, Pastor, when I got that letter, it scared me to death. He said, I had never received a letter like that before. And I said, I had never written a letter before either like that. So, so what happened? He said, I thought if I become president, how would I keep the Sabbath? And he struggled with that. And you would think, well, you know, you gotta be president, why is he struggling with that? Because this man was an honest man. He was wealthy, but he was more interested in spiritual things, you understand? But to the community, they didn't know that. But with me, he would open up and tell me about his situation. So he said, when I got the letter, I ran and became president. But I didn't want you to know until I did what you said. Don't forget the temple, Nehemiah. He said, I didn't forget the temple. I built it. And then he looked at me and he said, I built it, now you fill it. <laughs> so I had the chore on the end of doing a, a week of prayer that week. Well, as we we're finishing the week of prayer, he looked at me and he said, I've been thinking about it, Pastor. I want to be the first in that baptistry. I said, wonderful. So then the, that night, I got a telephone call from the king. So I went to visit him. And the king said, I've been thinking about it. And I want to be the first in that baptistry. <laughs> now I got a problem. So I went back to the president and I said, I got good news and bad news. Which one do you want first? He said, give me the good news. I said, the good news is that the king wants to be baptized. And he said, praise the Lord. Now what's the bad news? He wants to be first. <laughs> and I remember the president went, oh. And then he looked up and said, all right, but I'm second. <laughs> and so that Sabbath, we baptized 75 people. Baptized the king, the, the president, and baptized several senators and several high echelons of society people. So God uh, has people out there who have means. But the way to reach them is you have to approach them with the Bible. With what? With the simple things of the scriptures. They're so surrounded with all sorts of philosophy and all sorts of politics and all that that frankly, most of the time it makes them sick. They want to hear something genuine, something real, something that actually does something for their soul. And when they find that, they rejoice, they're glad, and they'll do anything to have it. And so, uh, because I fly, I, I sometimes am upgraded. I'm a million miler with Delta and a million miler with United. 
So I've flown enough million miles to go to the moon and back. Okay. Now, I sit next to people in first class that are business people. Okay. So recently I was flying from Guam to Hawaii. And the man next to me uh, didn't look anything other than a common person. So I began my usual conversation. Are you following for, uh, for business or for pleasure? Pleasure or business? I said, what kind of pleasure or business do you do? He said, I'm a famous person. Well, the first time in my life, I had somebody tell me, I'm a famous person. <laughs> so I said, well, what do you do? And then he told me. He happens to be the person who is in charge of all the animation for Disney World. You know, the movies and all that, and Sony. So I uh, said, well, wonderful. I said, I'm glad to hear that. He said, well, what do you do? I said, I'm a pastor. You're a pastor? I said, yes, I'm a pastor. So then I said, so what kind of pleasure were you having? He said, well, I went to the Philippines and we went to help young people there. And I uh, taught some classes, etc., about design and art and all that to help young people have a future in artwork and all that. So I said, well, did you, did you enjoy it? Oh, very much so. He said, I love that kind of stuff. He said, the other stuff is just, you know, I do it because that's the way I make money. But what I really love is to help young people. So now I find out that this man, under all of that, has a yearning heart to do something, some good for somebody, you understand? So then he says to me, hey pastor, what do you know about demon possession? I said, uh, well, I happen to have written a book about that. You've written a book about that? I said, yes. What do you want to know? He said, well, and then he began to tell me all of his life story how his father was a Satanist and how he's trying to stay away from Satanism and, and how, what do you do, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Long story short, uh, he had some problems, he emailed me. I emailed him back the answers. He wrote me back. Recently he had a challenge and I said, well look, I will, if it's okay with you, I will put that concern to prayer and I have a chain of people who pray. If it's okay with you, can I submit that request to them? He emailed me back and said, please do. So I did. So I wrote them back and I said, I, I put your concern to prayer. Well, he immediately emailed me the following day. He said, you won't believe this. It was somebody who was trying to commit suicide. He said, you won't believe this. He said, but that person uh, came out of the bathroom and gave up the, the brace of lace and all that to her mother and it was just a miracle. So he said, Pastor, thank you so much for lifting up that request in prayer. Okay? Now this man is a multimillionaire. Do you understand? But where's his chiefest concern? in the spiritual aspect, okay? Uh, do you remember the Beatles? Uh, you remember Harrison? What was Harrison's quest? What was he trying to find? He was trying to find God. Trying to find what? God. And before he died, he, was, he made a statement that he was trying to find God. So, there are a lot of people who are wealthy and who in the exterior appear to have need of nothing. But they're just as human as you and I are. And when it comes to, to uh, the serious things of life, they begin to, to try to find meaning to life. And they first begin with family. They try to satisfy the meaning of life with surrounding themselves with people who they love and people who they feel love them. So their children and their family. 
Then they finally want to find peace and heart. But they want to find it in something that's genuine, nothing that's plastic. And all it takes is for them to see somebody. Sometimes they get attracted to somebody who's, who doesn't have anything to offer them. But they sense that that person may have something that they can give to them, and that's salvation. So you simply treat people in a very common way. Find ways that you can approach people who are of mean. The sense of the way that people treat people important. Treat them important in the sense that you consider them to be a candidate for the kingdom of God. And then lift them up in prayer. Uh, those of you who are professionals, what you should do is single out somebody that you want to reach and then with that group of 10 professionals begin to pray for that person continuously. Then try to have a social meeting, a eating or something, where you can invite that person to be with you. So they can get acquainted with your crowd. In that environment, try to make it a spiritual, not a religious, but a spiritual atmosphere where you freely talk about the Lord and you then have prayer for the food, etc. And you might want to share a Bible verse. That's it. You don't want to do much of anything. Then socialize with that person. And that person then will be kindled in his heart, a desire to come back to be with such a simple, unassuming atmosphere. And as you pray for that person, God will then use those 10 professionals to have an influence to draw that person into their circle. And before long, that person will start becoming like the 10 that they're associated with. Okay? So you don't have to think of being a rocket scientist to reach the people who are high. You just have to pray, be uh, in, in, intentional in what you're trying to do, form a core that you can trust, that you can uh, bring somebody into that circle, and then by prayer and fellowship, you'll be able to draw people into a genuine spiritual experience. And then through those people, they usually know others and others and others. Um, I've known people who, become, who I befriend, and then those people introduce me to other people, and to other people, and to other people. And it's, it's glorious to see how then that ripple effect uh, works. So that, for example, with the, uh, the I have a friend who's a, the first Supreme Court judge in Guam, and um, if I want to go Washington, D.C. and meet with somebody in Washington, D.C., she's willing to make arrangements so I can meet with somebody in Washington, D.C. Because they have influences. They have circles, inner circles. They're very careful about their inner circles, but when they have confidence in you, they will then open up and try to encourage the inner circle to consider that maybe you can be a blessing to them. Okay, let's pray. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity to fellowship together. There's much more that can be said, but obviously the rich young ruler came because he felt a need. Zacchaeus came because he also felt a need. But it was him that was looking for the Savior that found salvation. And there are many out there who are looking for the Savior, while there are those who are looking for only salvation. We pray that you lead us to those who are looking for the Savior and somehow help us to impress them with the one that we know, whom to know is life eternal. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.